David Manson is the chief investment officer at Manson Group uh, with $3.85 billion in assets under management. He joins us from Newport Beach, California. It's great to see you, David. Thank you very much for your time. Evening your side. Uh, you heard from Charles Evans saying that, you know, we are watching the data month on month, uh, but it needs to be, uh, you know, obviously uh, a calibrated approach needs to be taken towards rate hikes. But uh, some in substance of what he was essentially indicating was that the Fed is very much on course for adre- aggressive rate hikes. When you look under the hood at the data, whether it's a consumer holding up, whether it's, it's the housing, pra- housing market not cracking as much as expected, inflation expectations easing, do you think the Fed is on the right track? Well, no, I think that they're doing some of the right things, but for the wrong reasons. I do think they're going to break housing, and I think there's a much more significant weakness coming in in the U.S. housing market than is already evident in the data. The volumes have slowed significantly. The prices are what will follow in the months ahead. And indeed, most of the data bears that out. You saw the case logic, the Schiller Index today. Um, Even though it was still up 15% year over year, all of that growth came in the last half of last year and the first couple months of this year. The disinflation in housing prices is finally coming, but it, it has a lot more room to go to get back to affordability. So I think that they basically have to continue talking hawkishly as long as the headline inflation number is that high. But ultimately, I think the Fed will be looking for an off ramp sooner than people think. Uh, And what convinces you of that? Because, uh, you know, so far it seems like they've been talking hawkish and acting hawkish as well. Contrary to the narrative that was doing the rounds about them acting dovish, despite signaling uh, that they would be aggressive. I think that's exactly right so far. But we also are dealing with a Fed funds rate that has a three handle, which isn't even up to the 50 year average. And so they haven't broken anything yet. Why I believe that the Fed is more up to try to soothe the markets is that the unpopularity of a recession is far worse than the unpopularity of excess liquidity and elevated prices. I think the Fed knows what most don't want to discuss, which is that the interest rate is not the key variable in driving higher inflation. We have a supply side inflation problem. They're limited in what they could do. I like the fact the Fed funds rate has come back above 3%, but getting it to 45 and 5% and people talking about Paul Volcker levels from the early 1980s, this Fed for 25 years, not 25 months, has coddled risk assets, and I simply do not believe that's going to change. What does this mean uh, in terms of money-making opportunities in the market, uh, David? How are you sizing those? Well, I really believe we're in a prolonged period where people need to not count on multiple expansion and higher P.E. ratios driving the returns. So that basically means it's probably not a great time for index investing. We know all three of the indexes are in bear market territory. The most frothy and highly valued ones, the NASDAQ, is down the most. But I think on a go-forward basis, we want to be invested where there is good cash flow generation behind higher quality companies. We don't know the impact of Fed policy. We don't know what recessionary conditions await. We don't know what global conditions await. There's a lot of instability, whether it's monetary or macroeconomic. And that drives us into higher quality positions, which is why we favor dividend growing companies. Right. And we'll talk about those dividend growing companies. But as an asset class, um, what do you think is a, is a classic inflation hedge? Because gold has not kind of lived up to its standard thus far. Uh, no, gold hasn't lived up to its uh, standard for 42 years as an inflation hedge. I think gold is right now about half of its inflation-adjusted price in 1980. So we don't believe gold is an inflation hedge. And we clearly know that bonds, especially sovereign debt, are not inflation hedges. I think dividend growth has proven to be the greatest inflation hedge for 10, 20, 40, 100 years. If companies are not growing their revenues, there is no inflation. So the ability for companies with pricing power to pass on the impact of inflation, not right away, there can be a lag effect. We see that with some consumer staples, some of which have done very well this year, especially food-oriented staples. 
energy companies tend to be a great inflation hedge. But any company that can grow their earnings and pass on a growing dividend at a rate higher than inflation, that's done very well for investors for a long time. Interesting thoughts, David. Uh, stay right there. I just want to uh, uh, bring up Citi's move on McDonald's and talk a little bit more about the consumer and also uh, inflation side of things coming in from the food, uh, food sector. Uh, McDonald's, of course, has been under focus, cutting their price target to $246 from $275. Citi has done that and putting the stock on a 90-day catalyst watch. Uh, that's on the back of Europe where they see demand dropping as we head into the winter and also headwinds from the strong dollar. McDonald's, of course, down nearly 3% overnight, the biggest drag on the Dow. On top of the fact that FX headwinds are not necessarily being accounted for correctly in street estimates today, and we think come the third quarter earnings call after that street will likely readjust their numbers a little bit lower going forward and better reflect really the FX headwinds and the, the operating environment that's about to come uh, in Europe for, for the brand. And the reason we call out McDonald's here is the fact that they do have greater operating exposure to that market relative to any of the other brands in our universe. David, how do you respond to that, uh, you know, at a time when, of course, the consumer is sensitive to rising inflation, but inflation expectations are easing. But on the other hand, uh, given what's happening on the food supply chains, uh, you are looking like companies like McDonald's exercising their pricing power and increasing uh, product prices. Oh, they most certainly are. And they have been and they have a significant franchise revenue model. Uh, the fact of the matter is that the same argument he just made about Europe, people made marginally about Russia earlier in the year. That, uh, McDonald's stood to lose a lot of Russian opportunity. McDonald's went on to make new highs after that. They have significant pricing power. And I think his argument about the currency is a very strange one. The dollar, uh, a strong dollar has hurt McDonald's in Europe. The dollar has been rallying all year. If anything, you could argue that's a coiled up bullish argument or an eventually weakening U.S. dollar, giving a boost to McDonald's multinational revenue. So uh, they have been a very non-cyclical company, not tethered to the consumer, which, as you point out, the consumer isn't even showing signs of weakness. Consumer mm. confidence retail sales have still continued to hold up just fine. Yeah, and I want to bring in that angle because the rising dollar and its impact on S&P 500 earnings, uh, I'm just looking at the data out there, 70% of the S&P 500 revenues come from the U.S., which means 30% come from international markets. Uh, has that been factored in? We're, we're at, what, 3,600 for the S&P? Uh, has that been factored in, the, uh, the strength of the dollar and what that means uh, for a hit on revenues on account of just currency adjustments? Yes, I think that uh, earnings expectations are factoring in certain currency projections. And when those currency projections prove to be wrong, the earnings forecast can be wrong. But that can cut both ways. There's also a lot of companies that hedge such currency risk. It's a bigger factor with multinationals. We're big uh, investors in Procter Gamble, and they have an awful lot of those global sales. You think of the big food and beverage companies like Coca-Cola, Pepsi. Pepsi is another one that we own at our firm. And so there's definitely impact around the currency, but no one has ever proven to be able to get their stock forecast right off of currency movements. They add to vol, and that's important mm -hmm. investors. They add to volatility, but being able to size it into earnings expectations month by month and quarter by quarter, you just simply have to focus on operating results. Okay, we have three minutes, David, and three stocks to get by and get through. Uh, let's start off with your view on Cisco. Well, Cisco is one of the names we own that has come down this year, these old tech themes. And we like the fact that, you know, we still have so many energy names and consumer staples names and healthcare names that have done quite well this year. And so Cisco is one that on weakness, we like being able to buy more of because we believe that the environment for uh, kind of fee revenue out of networks, servers, routers, they've really evolved into more of a subscription driven revenue model and that recurring revenue is going to create multiple expansion uh they're very low valued and so for a company like cisco with still double digit revenue growth to be getting those low pe's we think there's a real fundamental story and they prove it with their ongoing dividend growth 
the management believes in their ability to execute. Retail pharmacy chain Walgreens is down 40 percent year to date, but you still like it. Yeah, we think there is. I, we would never buy a stock just for a takeout possibility. But at these levels, we're quite sure there's plenty of private equity companies looking at Walgreens. There is a great opportunity for people to take advantage of this lower multiple and acquire the company at a much lower price than fair value, but a higher price than what it trades at now. But they've simply had some really difficult problems to overcome. The old COO of Starbucks is the CEO of Walgreens now. We think he's operationally riding the ship, but it's going to take time for Walgreens stock price to improve. And the last one that you like from the energy space is the midstream energy. I'm looking at, again, the chart performance over here. Nothing to really write home about. What gives us that alpha in this market? Well, I'm not sure what chart you're looking at. You, the um, fact of the matter is that over the year, UMI is up double digits in a market that's in a bear market. It was up substantially last year. In about 18 months, you're talking about 40% price gains. But most of the returns come from the distribution. These companies give out. You're talking about pipelines and uh, gas terminals and so forth. And they're distributing 5 6% through two investors as well. So we think that the midstream energy story is clearly undervalued, large yield spreads, and Russia and, excuse me, Europe and Asia both need to be buying more liquefied natural gas from the United States. Now, that's actually the chart. You're right, uh, David. Uh, USEF Midstream Energy Income Fund is higher up this year by 5%. And, of course, you're bullish on this name as well. David, lovely to have you on the show. Thank you very much for stopping by Late Your Side. We really appreciate your insights and thoughts.